Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. I'd like to welcome everyone to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea. And this is the podcast where we talk about daily uh, things that you can do to maintain inner peace, to find your happiness. What are the different tasks and ways of thinking that we can do this? And on my show, I like to have guests for us to learn from their wisdom. And I'm very pleased to have with us Dr. Huff. And Dr. Huff is going to speak to us about uh, his experiences and the heroic efforts that he made in building community. I've written about and spoken about the importance of community for bringing people together. And I really feel that it's necessary for us to find our own happiness and inner peace through the workings of community. This is why I'm very pleased to have Dr. Huff with us so that he can share about community building and how that can affect our sense of inner peace so that we can have some takeaways and how can we build a stronger knit neighborhood or larger community. So I'm very pleased to have Dr. Huff with us and uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. Well, I sure appreciate this opportunity to share. Wonderful. If, uh, you can share a bit about yourself and your background, and then we'll jump into some of the uh, wisdom and insights that you have on community. Okay. Well, again, my name is C.J. Huff, and um, grew up in southeast Kansas and currently reside in southwest Missouri in the community of Joplin. I uh, have served the last uh, 20 years or so in uh, public education as an elementary teacher, uh, elementary principal, and, and most recently as superintendent of the schools. Uh, retired in uh, July of 2015, and uh, since that time, I've primarily been doing consulting uh, specific to uh, community engagement strategies and what we can do to build um, uh, stronger com- communities, more resilient communities, uh, through finding our common ground and working with youth and, and um, bringing communities together to uh, focus on how we can grow a generation of, of um, youth that are, that are ready to, to go out and uh, and uh, support a family and hold down a job and, and, uh, and, you know, continue to give back and be a part of their community. So that's, that's been my primary focus. But outside of that, I'm, I'm a proud father of three ch- children. My wife and I just celebrated our 20th anniversary uh, this July and uh, just loving life right now. That's awesome. And uh, congratulations on the anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that, that's great. And um, I, I know the, uh, you know, main event, and, you know, I would assume it was a a major event in your life that really prompted some of this attention to you and and Joplin uh, was the tornado of a few years ago. Yes, in uh, May, May 22nd, 2011, we had an EF5 tornado uh, blow through Joplin, Missouri, and um, uh, on a Sunday evening, it was about an hour after our graduation ceremonies, our high school graduation ceremonies, and and uh, destroyed um, a large por- portion of our city, about a third of our community, uh, 50,000 people, uh, was absolutely leveled. Uh, lost 161 friends and neighbors in that disaster, as well as a number of school facilities. And, and uh, you know, beyond the structural toll, obviously the emotional and, and you know, the physical, emotional, spiritual toll it took on, on our community was, uh, was very significant. I, I couldn't even imagine... Uh you know, what the community had to go through when you have the devastation to that large of a degree. You know, we're not talking a a neighborhood and we're we're talking a good percentage of of the entire town itself. Yeah, so we we lost about 8,000 homes in in that disaster. And uh, in terms of our school system, we had um, 10 buildings were damaged, six of them destroyed. We had... uh, um, you know, um, about, I think it was around 3,000 students who actually live in the, in the path of the disaster. And so, you know, when you, when you think about something of that scope, um, you know, communities have basically two paths they can follow at that point. You either come together or you fall apart. And, um, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm really proud of is just how this community rallied and responded to 
uh, not just disaster, but more importantly, um, responded to one another and how, how uh, that strong sense of community and that desire and kind of that love thy neighbor uh, philosophy and, and, um, and uh, really focusing in on how we can take care of each other and, and support one another during the, that very difficult time was really an amazing thing to, to be a part of and be witness to. So, and I, I'm sure you're quite biased in this, and I realized before I asked this question, but how would you describe Joplin prior to that event? Where, was it a, a tight-knit community that typically would be helping each other out, or did this come about because of, uh, you know, that, that disaster and the life-changing event? Yeah, Joplin's a, a really special place. It, it's um, always been and continues to be a community that's uh, tightly bound together. Um, you know, it, it's it's um, it's um, uh, you know kind of a regional hub for for the four state area and and uh, a lot of things to do here. But it's it's again it's a great place for families and and uh, you know, our faith uh, community is very strong uh, in Joplin. Uh, we have school strong school systems. We've got a supported business community. And even though we we struggle just like every other community across the country in terms of our economy um, and trying trying to grow, uh, I would tell you that um, that um, these are people here that that truly care about one another and and uh, have a strong sense of, of faith and and, and uh, commitment to supporting one another. And one of the things we worked on uh, prior to the disaster uh, related to that was trying to create systems of support specifically to engage our community and in, in, um, in supporting the youth in our community. And, and then we started a, an initiative in 2010, just about uh, nine months ahead of the disaster, which uh, we were so fortunate to have in place was a, was a framework that we began referred to as the bright futures framework. And it consists primarily of three things, you know, meeting kids basic needs within 24 hours and rallying community resources to make that happen. And everybody working together to, to, uh, to support our youth in, in that sense. Uh, the second piece is about building capacity, both in terms of leadership and, and resource capacity within our community to, um, uh, to again, to um, uh, bring, bring together the best of what our community has to offer um, our, our children and in our, in, our, in our community. And then the last piece is this concept of service learning and, and giving kids the opportunity to give back to the communities that, that is giving the community that's giving to them um, and, and trying to embed this ideal of service above self in, in, in our youth. So, you know, to say our, our community was uh, highly engaged in our schools and in and, and our youth and we saw our children as a kind of a rallying point, uh, not just before the disaster, but certainly after the disaster and getting our school systems back and up, up, up and operational. Uh, was a direct result. It was. It wasn't by accident. It was a direct result of the the hard work that had been going on in this in this community for quite some time, and um, and certainly paid dividends uh, in our what I would say is our was our dark, darkest hour. Well, most definitely, and you know when when I read about you know especially um, you know with the school systems and how uh, quickly that was able to get up and running and and redone, given the amount of, of devastation, it is just more than amazing and that's where I, I really wanted to kind of pivot the talk in the sense that you know you you have a, a community that loses money of its physical resources but as well in in, in what you had mentioned you know the just the emotion and, and, and uh, spiritual toll that takes how do you even begin to rally a community together that is, I don't know if they were, they were feeling lost maybe, but you know, how do you rally people together to find that there is some hope in this? You know, I, I think for us, it was more about, um, you know, granted where, where we were on May 22nd, that evening of May 22nd, it, it was a, it was a terrible place to be. Uh, you know, confusion, chaos, I mean, all the things you can expect after that kind of devastation were, you know, it really gripped the community. And I think, I think what really um, changed the game for, um, for us is, uh, number one, we were, you know, when, the, when people from the surrounding area and actually across the country and around the world came pouring into Joplin and us being willing to accept that help and, and being appreciative of that, uh, of that support was, was a big part of that. You know, we, we realized right away that we weren't uh, in this by ourselves. And so, um, so seeing, seeing that sense of community, not just, you know, if you think about it more broadly in terms of the global community, 
uh, rallying to our cause. I think that was um, very encouraging to the heart. Uh, the other thing that happened too were, were a number of organizations in the school district included in that stepped up right away. And and uh, in our particular case, I'll just speak, you know, from my standpoint, uh, the school system. But um, you know, even even in a crisis type situation, a worst case scenario type situation, it's important to to continue to have vision. Um, you know, visions that what word gets thrown out there a lot and, and sometimes overused, but. But in our particular case, um, you know, our, our vision, our short-term vision was to um, account for the status of all, all of our students and staff, and we got to work on that right away. And then we had longer-term vision in terms of um, temporary facilities uh, that um, we would put in place to uh, support our kids' education in spite of the challenges and, and get them back on school that fall. And then uh, much broader than that, um, we had a longer, even longer-range vision of uh, of um, uh, creating an education system and rebuilding our education system uh, better than it was before. And all those things were really important, I think. You know, we had a short-term, in essence, we had a short-term, mid-term, and a long-term goal uh, that we'd established. And um, once those goals were established, people could start seeing uh, right away that, uh, you know, even though where we were at that particular moment was an abysmal place to be, uh, being able to set that goal and create a future story for our, for our kids in our community uh, really became a, a rallying point for uh, not just not just community members and community leaders, but also um, uh, people from across the country that wanted to be a part of that initiative and got on board with that to help us get through it. And, and not that I'm going to try to make a, a comparison uh, in kind, but well, when I look at a lot of our neighborhoods and communities that are in decline and people don't know each other anymore and, and there's a, a lot of uh, disarray in services and um, not just the poverty, but uh, the physical poverty, but uh, I think a lot of just poverty of, of the emotion of, of knowing what's going on, you know, in, in uh, your own community. I, I don't make in kind, you know, comparison to what happened over in Joplin, but how how do we take some of the things that was done in that creation and, and what you had spearheaded with the schools that can maybe help us in building up, uh, you know, neighborhoods and communities? You know, that's a really good question. I get asked that question quite often, frankly, and and, um, you know, when we look at the, the work of uh, building communities and engaging the communities in meaningful ways, you know, one of the things that uh, the communities have to be cognizant of and be willing to admit to is that uh, even though we always try to put on our best face from a, from a marketing of our community standpoint to get people to move there, uh, there are things when, in all of our communities that need, need attention. And there's a term that I like to use. It's uh, The term is entropy which is uh, defined basically as deterioration from within. And uh, it can happen so quickly and so easily when we're not, we're not paying attention to what's happening inside of our community. So number one, just paying attention and becoming more aware of the realities, not the perception you're trying to create uh, from a marketing standpoint to, to people and organizations and businesses outside the community that you want to have come to move your community, but being honest um, with the challenges that you have and, and then, uh, and then very intentional and strategic with, with your approach on how you're going to address those challenges. And, and so, you know, when you, you mentioned poverty, there's all kinds of poverty in, in this world. And I think one of the, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, poverty in the, in, in the truest sense, I think is, is that I, I've, I've known a lot of people. In fact, I, I, we didn't have a lot growing up myself uh, when I was a kid, but the one thing we had that, um, that you couldn't take away from us, regardless of the economy, you know, I grew up on a farm and, grew up during the, the times of the farm crisis in the 1980s. And, and the one thing that we had going for us um, uh, through a couple of, uh, you know, a decade and a half of really tough times were relationships. And I think that, that uh, what separates our communities and what separates, you know, when we start talking about at-risk youth and, and uh, some of the challenges and we talk about gang violence and gang recruitment and even, even going deeper and talking about uh, what's happened with ISIS and their ability to recruit uh, kids online. Mm -hmm. You know, kids, kids are hungry for relationships. And, and I would tell you that so many of our children and, and, and I would say adults as well uh, have become relationship poor. And uh, that's something that, that um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not, anything that, that, that there's not going to be public policy that fixes that. It's not going to be, you know, a government um, agency that's going to come in and fix that. It's really about local communities uh, taking ownership and, and part of the problem within their community and, and talking about how they can build stronger relationships 
to build the capacity they need to to um, flourish uh, long term. Um, because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, in our particular case, with our disaster, it was really about the pre-need relationships, relationships we had in our community prior to the disaster that made our uh, recovery effort possible. And so, when you look at, um, you know, and I don't think your your analogy is far off. I, I think that our disaster in Joplin is reflective of, of many communities that are that are struggling across the country to try to figure out, you know, to find their way out of the economic or other disaster, you know, the the historical uh, issues that they, they're dealing with that have kind of crept up on them over time. And and so as we as we look at this work of, of community engagement and community building, it's really about uh, getting away from this talk of of uh, when we talk about kids in particular and the next generation, it's it's more it's not so much about this call for taking back our streets. It's really about taking back our youth and rebuilding those relationships and and uh, not just with, with the kids, but also amongst and between adults that can that have resources uh, that can uh, come to the table and and help problem solve some of these greater challenges that are that are facing our children that are that are uh, creating from a long term perspective some of the some of the um, uh, broader disasters uh, above and beyond just natural disasters that we're faced with. Well, would you figure, and, and there's no cut and dry necessarily, at least I don't think, but would you figure this is easiest, best done when we're talking a grassroots from the neighbors themselves who want to make the difference and move that up? Or is this a, a policy making and government intervention that needs to bring uh, these relationships and, and people together. Yeah, you know, there's a quote by um, Herbert um, Humphreys um, that goes something along the lines that the uh, the uh, hand of government can never replace the caring hand of a neighbor, or something to that effect. And uh, when we talk about you know community building, it, it really you hit it. It's grassroots. It has to start from the bottom up. And the challenge we have is is for communities to be able to put together because even even within communities and every community is unique. When I when I do uh, work with communities uh, across the country, we we have some really frank conversations about how their community is um, unique from other communities or the community next door. And and I refer to it. It's kind of like every community has its own unique DNA based on a lot of different factors, including the, you know the politics of the community, the leadership, the the relationships, the, the uh, resources that they have available, the needs that they have, the history of that community can come into play. And all those things that, that, uh, that make that community unique and special, uh, you know, it's not about, it, it, it's, it's not about judging the community where they're at. It's about, you know, taking the, the strengths that they have and building on those strengths to build capacity. And, um, and so, you know, to do that work, it, it's really, you know, it's really not my place um, as, a, as a consultant that comes in and advises communities or the place of the government to come in and, and say, you need to be doing X, Y, and Z. It's really about the community going through a process of self-discovery, being honest with themselves and, and taking a, a truly grassroots um, approach to um, uh, problem solving uh, those issues, taking ownership of those those issues, not pointing the blame at, um, you know, politics or government or whatever, uh, but looking internally and saying, okay, what what do we have uh, at our disposal? What resources do we have in our community? What you know, who, who can who? What relationships do we have available that we can bring to bear on this particular problem? And let's uh, let's create a let's have a conversation about it. And then and beyond that, and more importantly, let's let's actually take action and let's quit talking about it. So you know, this work is is very much grassroots and it's very much action oriented. It's it's not just talking about problems. It's actually bringing together your resources so you can problem solve those issues. And, and I'm all for taking action. That That's a, a big theme of mine. And whether it's your own personal life and your uh, personal growth or, uh, you know, as we're mentioning with the community and neighborhood, what, what would you say, I mean, for people who would be listening, who, you know, are, are sitting there nodding their heads and in total agreement with what you're saying, as am I, that what is it that we can use to kind of, I don't know if it's push people would be the right thing, but how do we help people to understand that there is hope at the end of this, that, that there is a point to even trying I hear often, you know, people will either say, you know, um, we can't make any change because the government will get in the way, or we can't make any change because I'm the only one who wants to make change. There's all those excuses of why you can't, or as you say, the, the finger pointing as to, you know, well, what, what's, 
you know, what do I see as the true problem? So let that person fix their problem first. How do we just get the people to say, all right, just, just forget all this and, and do it? You know, that, that's a really great question, too. And, and one of the and again, every community is uniquely different. And some some communities, quite frankly, aren't ready to take that next step. Um, there are a number of factors that come into play with that. But at, at the end of the day, it, it, it always boils down to and it doesn't matter what you do programmatically. Um, there, there's no framework that you can bring to town or no program that you can bring to town that's going to solve all those problems unless you've got um, a strong leadership in place to drive that agenda forward. You have to find those champions in your community and not your typical champions either. It, you know, it's, uh, you know, I work with communities. I, I talk to them a lot about, you know, think about those individuals in your community that, uh, that um, need to take ownership in this work to have have diverse you know looking at diverse circles of influence and and uh, finding those people with, that that believe like you believe and and uh, understand why this work is important and get them to the table first and then leverage those relationships that they have to to get more people on board to move this effort forward and, and really truly create a movement and uh, you know that's the, the encouraging thing is, and this is this is what I've learned, and I saw it firsthand in Joplin uh, after our disaster, and and really defined a lot of, of who I am and what I believe. But the thing I've learned is there, you know, in spite of all the negativity that you see out there, whether it's on the news or in print or on social media or, or wherever wherever you experience that, in spite of all the negativity that's out there, there is much 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 more good in this world than there is bad. And, and what I've learned in the work that, that we've done is that there are many, many good people uh, in every community who, who want to do something, but you have to give them a way to get involved and engaged in a meaningful way. And, and what I also know is that good people um, uh, from all walks of life, and I'm not talking about people with, with money, I mean, it's the haves and have nots. There are good people from all, all walks of life. And when good people fully understand a particular problem that needs to be solved and know where to go to get the resources to solve the problem. They're, they're compelled to act. They, they have no choice but to act. They have to get involved and engage and do something about it. And they will rally when they know that there's, there's a way to get the job done. And I think that that's, you know, from, from my standpoint, one of the lessons learned is that you have to create a path for them to be able to go down to find, to find their way to that point. Uh, you know, point A and point B looks different in every community. Our, our job and the work that I do is is uh, helping communities find that um, find that path to, uh, to get them from point A to point B. And it's hard work, and and we have some honest conversations about what that looks like. But um, it's uh, it's time it's time worth spent. And uh, once you get those types of people involved and engaged, and, and and many times they don't even know one another, but you get them in the same room, they all of a sudden they find out they have they have a cause that they all believe in. They will rally. In your experience, do you find it to be true that if we have a stronger knit neighborhood or community that the individual is going to feel more at peace and, and feel that sense of happiness? No, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that, that we found as well is that as we engage the community at a much broader level, and it's not just superficial, it's deep, meaningful work, um, people from all walks of life, again, they, they want to be involved and engaged. They want to, they want to support their community, I believe. And, and uh, it doesn't matter whether you're on disability or, or, uh, or uh, you know, the president or CEO of a major company in town. Uh, we, all, we all have a desire to feel that we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. And, and so creating that movement uh, – um, is, a, is a part of, of that process of, of giving people an opportunity to get engaged in a meaningful way to help them to, um, uh, to find, uh, find joy in living by supporting others and, and, and serving others and getting back again to that love thy neighbor philosophy. Mm -hmm. and, and if we could all just kind of live that in that realm and that, uh, in that uh, vision for uh, what communities can look like, I, I just wonder what this, what, this country, uh, what this country could become if we, can, if we can move everybody towards that type of thinking. And, and I totally agree. That's really been the premise that I work off of. And I'd ask the question because you're the one out in the field. You know, you, you've seen a lot of these neighborhoods. And to me, it, it's just endless, as, as you mentioned. You know, where, where would our nation be right now if, uh, let's say, even half the communities, you know, were, were tighter knit? Um, mm -hmm. what, what do you think has been part of the issue as to why, communities have kind of, of, you know, 
deformed the you know the the era and i i always feel old when i say when i was a kid but when, <laughs> when i was a kid you know neighborhoods and i didn't grow up in in a wealthy area i mean i it was just a regular middle class ish working neighborhood and, but we all knew everybody and then everybody there you know we didn't maybe all like each other but we respected everybody and we knew everybody and and uh, we could help each other but and that's a rare community to find nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really think there are a lot of those types of great things that, that happen out there still. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, days of service that I, that I see happen in, in communities we work with where they, you know, community organizations pull together and they do some really great things on, on one day of the year. And, and really this, this idea of serving others, I mean, it, it can't be an event. It's a way of life. And, and you have to create that kind of a culture in your community that, that not is it just, uh, just, it's not, it's not just something we, we do. It's, it's who we are. It, it's what we do for one another. That that's where we get our, you know, so that's where the life and blood of the community comes from. So, you know, where, where I see communities really struggle is, um, you know, when we, we think about all the, um, well, I'll just use, you know, the term politics, you know, politics is probably one of the things that stands in the way of a lot of, a lot of really, uh, you know, great, well-intended, um, uh, um, things that need to be happening in our community. So one of the things we talk about is leaving politics out of the, out of this conversation. Let's just, let's just rally around in this particular case. We talk about rallying around our children and leaving the politics out of it. Cause we know that, you know, we have such a, you know, a growing number of youth in this country that, that are suffering in a lot of different ways. And, and uh, we need to come up with um, creative solutions locally to, to solve some of those problems and politics can't have anything to do with that. Uh, right. The other thing that, that um, I would say is that uh, egos are often um, a problem. Uh, you know, people that, that do things, they, they do, they, they do a service project or, or help someone else, but it's, it's not so much because it was out of the goodness of their heart. It may have been something that needs to be done, but it was because of something you know, it was gonna it was gonna put them in a different light or um, get them some attention that they that they uh, felt like that uh, would be a benefit to them long term. And I'm not saying that's always the case, obviously, but but sometimes right. you know that that motive, that pure motive, isn't there. And so I, I think you know a lot of this uh, a lot of this um, work in in terms of changing that uh, you really kind of talk about DNA therapy for a community really is is uh, changing that culture of, of how we interact with one another and the reason why we do what we do to support one another uh, has to come from a very, very pure place. And um, sometimes I worry that sometimes that, that giving, whether it's corporate donations to a particular um, organization or, um, you know, an individual that steps out and, you know, and, you know, in the press releases that follow and the, the attention that's drawn on them really, you know, I, I, I think that that we've kind of gotten away from that pure purest uh, um, form of of giving, which is very very selfless and and um, and uh, very much about doing doing good for others without expectations of of being uh, being recognized for for doing that work. So I think I think that's one of the primary challenges I think communities have initially is just getting past the politics, the egos, and and just coming together for the right reasons and just you know not caring who gets the credit for it, just doing it because it's the right thing to do. And I'm in total agreement with everything that you just said. I would just love to see that actually happen. <laughs> As you said, there are people out there, but, you know, the the predominant uh, political field is lacking in that, I think. Um, so yeah, well, and that's unfortunate, and it's, but, it, but it is what it is. And I think that, again, you know, if you put politics aside, because you're, you're talking, uh, you know, when you're talking about politics, you're talking about, um, things that we really probably at the grassroots level can't control to that to that degree. It's it's really about you know those of us that that um, are, are you know at the ground level that that need to do that hard work. Right. When um you know you talk a lot about the children and and giving your history as an educator, the, I, I can see that as the focus. What, what role would children play in? a neighborhood or, or a community trying to, uh, you know, pull themselves back together. Cause I, I know we want to pull it together for the kids and, and for uh, their generations. What can they do and how might we be able to inspire them to take part? You know, I'm glad you asked that question. The um, reality of it is I think sometimes we sell our kids short in their capacity to be able to support 
um, support their communities and, and be a part of that that whole process. And when we when we talk about the work of adults and, and what the adults have to be doing and, and our behaviors, I, I've heard it once said that children uh, children may not uh, listen to what you say, but uh, but they certainly uh, pay attention to what you do. And I've seen that time and again, where you know when you have adults that are that are giving of themselves and supporting uh, the community and, and children who are close to them, whether it be a, you know, one of their own children or, or, um, you know, friends or children or whatever, you know, they, they tend to pay attention to that and they want to be engaged and involved too. And, and, you know, that, that ideal of service above self, I don't think has a, um, uh, has a, a stipulation in it that says you must be 18 in order to participate. You know, it's, right. it's one of those things that, that needs to be embedded in, in the lifestyle of the, the, of, of the community and the kids get that, those opportunities to give back too. And, and, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that, but from a, from a child development standpoint, um, you know, children also want to become something bigger. They, they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And, and we have to find ways to engage them in meaningful ways that are positive and, and have the opportunity to, um, to mold um, their thinking in, in the right kind of way uh, in, in terms of how, how they interact and behave within the communities that they will eventually serve is um, a, a real important part, I think, of the, of the growth and, and development of our kids. And I think, you know, and I'm going to get a little bit on my high horse here as a, as a former educator, that uh, sometimes I think we focus too much on that test score, uh, you know, nationally normed uh, test. Um, and when we really ought to be focusing on the character development and the, and the uh, you know, all that other stuff, the education piece will come. If we're doing a good job of educating kids, that, that piece will come. But, mm -hmm. but uh, relying on the standard of measure uh, in the way of a norm reference test as a determining factor of whether or not a child is ready to, to go out into life and do great things is really, I think, I think we're missing the mark in a big way. So, so I, th I think the kids have a lot of, op there are a lot of opportunities, leadership, op leadership development opportunities for, for children to get involved in of all ages. And I've seen it firsthand and I can give, give several examples if I had time of what that looks like. Yeah. And, and cheers for me for that comment. So the, I think we're, we're getting way too much in, into uh, missing the boat on actually developing uh, you know, holistic type children, but that would be a whole other podcast episode. Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, but definitely speaking to the, the choir on, on uh, this end. Um, so for those who would be listening who, you know, uh, again, are, are saying, hey, this is awesome. What would be a, a very practical, like first and second step if, if they're saying, you know, I, I want to make a difference in, in my little world, what would be like the, the first two main things that they could be doing that can really propel them on, on that path? You know, I think part of it um, is again about how do we, how do we identify those people in the community and rally those people in the community that, that, um, that have that same passion and see the same things that you do that see the same things that I've seen in communities across the country and get them all in the same room together and, and then, then be very strategic and intentional uh, with your next steps. And, and those next steps are going to look, look different in every single community based on where they're at at that time. But you have to, number one, know where you're at as a community. Where, where are we now today in terms of our youth? Where are we at now today in terms of, of uh, key, key issues in our community that, that are important to us and the, and the long-term prosperity of our community? And, uh, and, and, you know, and, and then just having those honest conversations and developing a plan and then act, uh, you know, sometimes, I mean, I've been in way too many committee meetings over the course of my career where lots of, uh, uh, uh debates were had and, and ideas shared, but that action piece is, is, uh, um, often where we miss the boat and, and then the willingness to, if it doesn't work to back up and try again and not give up. So, so that persistence piece becomes really important as well. So this work is, a, you know, it's a long-term commitment and people need to realize that going in and just be honest and real um, with, uh, with themselves and with members of their community and, and, um, and be willing to take that first step. It's a scary first step, but it, the work gets, uh, you know, I'm not going to say the work ever gets easier, but it certainly, uh, you get smarter about how you, how you uh, uh, make progress towards meeting whatever goals you've established for your community. Yeah, and that whole sense of that determination and definitely get it out of committee and just start doing something. Um, right. Yeah, uh, definitely. 
So as we're coming up on uh, time, is there anything that you feel we haven't touched on that needs to be touched on when it comes to focusing on community and uh, helping to find that inner peace? Sure. So, you know, one of the things that, that um, I feel really strongly about when we look at the cross section of our community is, you know, you don't skim, just skim the surface of, of uh, those circles of influence. You got to go deep and uh, look for people in, at all levels of the community that have have influence that that can bring people to the table to have those conversations and, and doing that within uh, all the sectors of the community, really looking at how we can draw the business community into a higher degree so we can start having conversations around workforce and economic development and now tie that more closely to um, the, the work that's happening in our, in our K-12 schools and getting people involved and engaged in that and creating opportunities for kids uh, to explore um, careers that they may not have even known existed in their own backyard. Uh, to uh, getting all the human service agencies that have a you know a lot of resources at their disposal, but uh, but collectively together uh, having conversations and, and being smart about how they use those resources so that so they can be most you know become very efficient with the resources the limited resources they do have and uh, yet provide better services to the people that need those services. Then the last piece. Uh, is uh, engaging the faith community. And I think that's, uh, I, I refer to the faith community as the sleeping giant of most communities. They, mm -hmm. There's a, a sense sometimes that the faith community can't get involved in, in, in the schools and, and so on and so on. But uh, um, the reality of it is the faith community, you know, that they, they represent all facets of the community. And on Sundays, you'll have business people and human service agency people and parents and educators and everybody uh, that come to church and, and, um, and uh, you know, getting, getting that consistent message of, of service to others and, and uh, building a stronger community through the work and getting, getting our churches, uh, churchgoers, our, 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 our folks out of the pews and into the community and, and doing that work is, is really, really important, I think, from a, from a, from a long-term perspective and, and, and a great, a great um, group to, um, to uh, communicate those needs and, and, and find the resources to, to support the, support, um, the youth and, and other issues you have in your community. So I, I think it's just important that people remember that there are, there are a lot of resources. If you stop and think about it and, and do take an inventory of, where you're at as a community, what resources you have available to tackle some of the greater challenges, you know, the creativity uh, that, that will come from the people, good people that want to make an impact and, and, and believe uh, like you believe and really want to uh, address those issues. I think, um, I, you know, just phenomenal things can happen. Much uh, agreement over here on, on all those comments. And I really appreciate all of your insights and the time that you take to, uh, share with us if people would like to learn more about you or to get in touch with you what's the best way for them to do that hey, you know go to my uh, website cj at cjhuff.com i'm also very involved in a um, organization called bright teachers usa and um, and they can look that up online at uh, brightteachersusa.org and uh, they'll they'll learn more about uh, the work we do and the communities we work in and they can they can uh, uh, do a little investigating on their own Excellent. And that's part of the action phase that they could uh, take is, you know, get some of the research done. Exactly. There you go. Great. Well, again, thank you very much for your time and, uh, you know, really appreciate the dialogue that we've had. And I encourage people to, you know, really reflect on what we've heard and most importantly, just to act, do some simple acts with, uh, you know, your direct neighbors and, Let's see how that can begin to spread into the uh, larger neighborhood and, and the larger community. Uh, so um, I appreciate everybody listening. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Huff, for joining us. Well, thank you for having me again. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.